Welcome, Alex, to our virtual biology camp. Today, we're going to be focusing on bacteria and viruses. No, Alex, we're just going to be discussing the topics. There's no need for a hazmat suit or to look for the contagious monkey from the movie Outbreak. Before we begin, let's just review quickly our discussion on what is considered living. Remember that we have stated in previous lectures that all living things have certain characteristics in common, such as consisting of cells, having the ability to grow, to metabolize, to reproduce, and etc. Now remember, those which lack these characteristics are not considered to be living. No, Alex, not undead. I mean simply not living. For instance, in today's lecture, we're going to be discussing a living organism known as bacteria. We're also going to be discussing viruses, but these are actually considered not living. Bacteria are living organisms made up of unicellular prokaryotic cells. Yes, Alex, that's right. Prokaryotic cells lack a nucleus. They also lack membrane-bound organelles. They're very simple other than their nucleic acids floating around in their cytoplasm along with ribosomes, which are all contained with a cell membrane that's surrounded by a peptidoglycan cell wall, and that's enclosed in a capsule. Yes, Alex, some bacteria may have outer structures that will help it propel, such as the flagellum. They also have pili, which help the bacteria adhere to surfaces such as food, liquids, or even other bacteria when they're trying to transfer genes. Yes, Alex, bacteria can actually transfer genes through a process known as bacterial conjugation, in which a bridge is created between two bacteria, and they refer to this bridge as sex pilus. Now, genes are then transferred in a circular form known as plasmids across one bacteria to the other. Yes and no, Alex, this is considered sexual reproduction, but simply because bacteria are exchanging genes to create a recombinant bacterial cell that has new traits, but in reality, you're not actually creating a new bacteria. You start with two and end up with two bacterial cells. Good question, Alex. Bacteria actually make more bacteria through asexual reproduction, which is called binary fission. This is where bacteria simply grow twice their size and then divide into two. Now, those will each divide into two and so on. Now, keep in mind that bacteria reproduce in a matter of minutes, which is why bacterial colonies will grow in size very rapidly. No, Alex, bacteria come in different shapes. The three main shapes that you must know are those that are of spherical shape, which have a suffix known as coccus, the rod shape, which have a suffix known as bacillus, or spiral shape, which have a suffix known as beryllium. No, Alex, he wasn't just making it up. The suffix coccus is referring to the shape of the bacteria. You're right, Alex, there is two different kingdoms of bacteria, but they are classified mainly based on their living environment as well as their structural components, not necessarily their shape. For instance, archaeobacteria live in harsh environments and do not have peptidoglycan cell walls. Their shapes may be similar to those seen among eubacteria, which is why classification isn't solely based on shape. Now, as for eubacteria, they do have peptidoglycan cell walls. They tend to live everywhere on Earth, and they can even be found living inside of eukaryotic organisms such as us. Yes, Alex, you're right. Strep throat is caused by a bacteria known as Streptococcus, which is, as we mentioned, a spherical shape and can lead to some severe symptoms such as fever, red swollen tonsils, sore throat, etc. Now, do you remember what your doctor prescribed to you to make you feel better? Yes, Alex, that's right. Antibiotics are prescribed drugs meant to kill bacteria by targeting their common prokaryotic structures. No, Alex, that's not what we want either, because not all bacteria living inside of us is harmful. In fact, we have more beneficial bacterial cells in our bodies than we do of actual human cells. Not exactly what I meant, Alex. I just mean that we have a lot of beneficial bacteria inside of our bodies. In fact, they are perfect examples of mutualistic relationships. The most common beneficial bacteria is those found in our intestines, also known as intestinal flora, which help us further digest food. 
Well, that's the thing, Alex, they're not protected. Because antibiotics are not very selective in what type of bacteria they're killing, they just basically destroy all bacteria that is in close proximity, which is why every time that we use or overuse antibiotics, we're not only killing the harmful bacteria, but we're also killing the beneficial bacteria. Yes, Alex, they can, depending on the severity though, which is why doctors will sometimes treat mild symptoms before prescribing antibiotics, hoping that your body can try to fight the infection on its own without the use of explosives such as antibiotics that will destroy all bacteria in close proximity, including the good ones. But let's say that your body fails to fight the infection, then that's when antibiotics are the best option. Yeah, Alex, something like that. Basically, antibiotics should be used properly and when truly needed. Just keep in mind that when antibiotics are used, it's important that good bacteria is replaced. Good question, Alex. You can replace the good bacteria by eating foods with probiotics such as yogurts. A probiotic has live cultures of beneficial bacteria. Yes, Alex, yogurt is made with live cultures of bacteria, which is why they are a great source of good bacteria. We actually use bacteria to produce a variety of different foods and beverages, such as sour cream, cheese, and many others. Now remember, bacteria doesn't just live inside of us. It may also live in soil. Yes, Alex, great job. That's why these bacteria are referred to as decomposers, which we know from our previous lecture, they play a huge role in food chains and nutrients getting recycled. For instance, some bacteria can digest oil, which is why scientists are trying to find ways to use this type of bacteria to help clean oil spills. So as you can see, there are many different types of bacteria, some of which are very beneficial and others not so much. Yes, Alex, you're right. Some bacteria are known as pathogens because they are disease-causing agents, such as E. coli and salmonella, which cause food poisoning, or H. pylori, which causes gastritis and ulcers, or even N. gonorrhea, which causes sexually transmitted diseases called gonorrhea, and many others. Basically, bacteria may produce diseases either by releasing poisons or toxins which will damage the host or by breaking down cells as a food source. Yes, Alex, some bacteria may do that because they are heterotrophs, which means they must consume organic material to obtain their energy. But on the other hand, there is other types of bacteria that are known as autotrophs, which produce their own food either through photosynthesis or chemosynthesis. Now just keep in mind that bacteria do not need a host to reproduce. They simply need the right environment and the right nutrients. Remember Alex, not all bacteria are harmful and those that are, our body's immune system has a great plan of defense towards finding and eliminating the threat. But the best method of prevention is to simply cover your mouth when coughing, using tissues, not your hands, to wipe your nose, and simply washing your hands after using the restroom or before eating. I think you're talking about vaccines, Alex, which can reduce the risk of obtaining specific bacterial infections. In fact, there are many diseases caused by bacteria that can actually be prevented with the use of vaccines. Great question, Alex. A vaccine is basically an inactive form of a bacteria that is injected into our bodies so that it could stimulate the body's immune system to produce antibodies. No, Alex, antibodies are actually meant to help our bodies identify foreign structures such as bacteria and viruses. That's why once the body gets a copy of what that foreign structure looks like from that inactive form of bacteria, it will be able to make an antibody that will identify that type of bacteria if it ever infects the body again. Yeah, Alex, I guess that's a good way to see it, as if antibodies are wanted posters of bad bacteria that our body will be looking out for just in case of an infection so that it can respond rapidly and destroy it before it becomes too severe. Great question, Alex. Viruses are infectious structures that are not living because they lack certain living characteristics, such as the ability to grow, metabolize, in other words, they don't need food or energy. Also, the fact that they can only reproduce by using the host cell's machinery, and that they are non-cellular, meaning they're not made up of cells, which means that they have no cell parts, no nucleus, no organelles. Yes, Alex, that's right. 
Viruses are considered to be parasitic, which means that all viruses require a host. Remember that a parasite lives in or on other living organisms, causing them harm. Now the host, on the other hand, is the living organism that the parasite lives on. Now a virus depends so much on their host cells that they are only active when living inside a living cell. Great question, Alex. In 1898, a Dutch scientist used filtration experiments to prove an agent smaller than a bacteria was actually causing tobacco mosaic disease, which affects numerous plants. He was actually the first to name these incredibly small particles as viruses, which led him to become known as the founder of virology, which is the study of viruses. Yes, Alex, you're right. Viruses are much smaller than bacteria. So you can imagine how small that must be if we know that bacteria are much smaller than eukaryotic cells. Now, viruses are so small that they can only be seen with a special powerful microscope called an electron microscope. Great questions, Alex. Viruses actually come in different shapes and sizes, such as complex, helical, enveloped, or polyhedral, but they all have two main components in common, nucleic acid and a protein coat. Yes, Alex, that's right. Capsids are made up of proteins, and as you can see in this image, the capsid may take different shapes, but they all enclose the viral nucleic acid, which can either be DNA or RNA. Now, sometimes the capsid may be enclosed further with an envelope, such as seen in the influenza viruses. Now, envelope or not, capsids have glycoproteins that have specific shapes which match receptors found on the surface of host cells, which basically allows the virus to attach and enter its host cell. Now, just keep in mind that viruses must bind precisely to that protein receptor found on the surface of the host cell. Alex, that's right. If viral infection begins when the genetic material of a virus gets inside of the host cell. But once a virus is inside of a host cell, two different processes may occur. Some viruses replicate themselves immediately, which results in the host cell getting destroyed. But then there's other viruses that do not kill the cell right away. We identify these two processes as viral life cycles, which are called lytic and lysogenic. Let's first start with the lytic cycle. Yes, Alex, the lytic cycle takes place when the virus injects its viral genome into the host cell and tricks it into producing viral parts. Eventually, the cell will become completely filled with new viruses, also known as virons, which will cause the cell to burst or lyse. So to sum it up, a lytic infection happens when a virus injects its viral genome into a cell, makes copies of itself, and eventually causes the host cell to lyse. For instance, take a look at this virus. Notice how it has a capsid which surrounds the DNA, which are the key indicators that this is a virus. Well, this particular virus is known as a bacteriophage T4, which is a virus that infects only certain types of bacteria, and it causes a lytic infection. Yes, that's right, Alex. Lytic infections are actively making copies of the virus and causes the cell to burst. Great question, Alex. Lysogenic cycle takes place when the virus injects its viral genome into the host cell and then makes the host cell make copies of the viral genome every time DNA replication takes place because the virus incorporates its DNA into the DNA of the host cell. So basically, the viral DNA is then replicated along with the host cell's own DNA every time the cell divides, resulting in two new cells with the same viral genomes. Now, lysogenic viruses do not kill the cell right away. They remain inactive or dormant for some period of time. Good question, Alex. Just keep in mind that viral DNA is embedded into the host cell's DNA, which means that it's going to be passed down to many different cell divisions. Now, eventually, this will lead to the spreading of viral DNA within the entire organism. Now, this might not seem like a big deal because it isn't destroying the host cells, but that's the thing. These type of infections may remain dormant for a long period of time before actually becoming active. Eventually, certain environmental conditions may trigger the switchover from the lysogenic to the lytic cycle. Yeah, yeah, I guess you could see it that way. For instance, retroviruses may remain dormant for a long period of time. 
No, Alex. Retroviruses have an RNA genome instead of DNA and an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, which makes DNA from RNA. And it integrates this viral DNA into the host DNA. Not really, Alex. These viruses may actually be very resistant to treatments such as HIV, which is an enveloped virus. Now, this human retrovirus is prone to more mutations because of that extra step in going from viral RNA to host DNA than to host RNA. Yeah, Alex, it is pretty scary and there isn't really a cure for HIV, but there is antiretroviral treatment available. And basically, the earlier HIV is diagnosed, the sooner treatment can start and hopefully lead to a long, healthy life. Now, this is why getting tested is so important. Not exactly, Alex. Remember, mutations can be harmful. However, they can also be beneficial. And when they are, they will eventually lead to evolution, which is why retroviruses such as HIV tend to evolve more quickly than other viruses, making it more difficult to treat since it continues to change. Well, that's the thing, Alex. HIV and other retroviruses may remain dormant for a long time, but eventually they may become active, causing the host cell to make new viruses, resulting in the destruction of the host cell. Now, in the case of HIV, that would be white blood cells. Keep in mind that antiretroviral drugs slow down the development of the virus, which is why they may prolong an individual's life. However, if HIV becomes too advanced and the immune system becomes severely damaged due to the huge destruction of white blood cells, then this may lead to a syndrome known as AIDS, which tends to have a shorter life expectancy. Retroviruses are responsible for some types of cancers. Good question, Alex. HIV is transmitted through bodily fluids such as blood, semen, breast milk, etc which means that HIV can be sexually transmitted or by sharing needles or even from a mother to a child during pregnancy, childbirth, or even while breastfeeding. Now, great question, Alex. In the past, this was actually a huge problem because patients would receive blood transfusions or organ transplants from individuals with HIV. Then the patient would unfortunately get HIV as well. But now things have changed in the United States, which has decreased that risk a lot because donated blood, organs, and tissues are carefully tested before being used on patients. There are many viruses that cause diseases, such as hepatitis, West Nile virus, chickenpox, and many more. But one that your body might be familiar with is the adenovirus, a naked virus, meaning it only has a capsid. This virus may cause respiratory illnesses, but don't worry, most infections are not that severe. They cause cold-like symptoms, sore throat, bronchitis, pneumonia, diarrhea, and even pink eye. Alex, the flu is actually caused by a different virus. Um, Alex, I think that might have been the fever talking, which is one of the more severe symptoms that is caused by the influenza virus, an enveloped virus, which may be seen as type A, B, or C, depending on the glycoproteins found on the virus, which are called antigens. Now, these antigens must match their host cell receptors, which is why viruses are very specific to what cells they infect. For instance, type A can infect humans and animals, but type B can only infect humans. Great question, Alex. Antibodies, as we mentioned before, are developed by your immune system to prevent future infections, which may be identified by certain antigens found on the virus. So they basically use antigens on the virus to identify that they are really foreign structures that must be destroyed. Overall, this virus is inhaled through the mouth or nose into the host's lungs, in which the virus will infect the respiratory cells, leading to the production of viral parts. Yes, Alex, Tamiflu is actually the brand name for an antiviral drug called Oseltamivir, which is why we simply call it Tamiflu. And this antiviral drug helps minimize the spread of the flu virus. Well, as we've been mentioning, there is little that we can do to cure a viral infection. Some drugs have been developed to interfere with the reproduction of the virus, but they basically just slow the effect of the virus long enough for your body to fight it off but they don't really provide an actual cure, which is why we have focused a great deal of our research in simply battling viral diseases with the use of vaccines. 
Yes, Alex, that's right. Vaccines have an inactive form of the virus or the bacteria, which gives our immune system a chance to do a practice run of fighting this infection so that it can be ready to respond and fight future infections much faster. Remember, this will result in our body producing antibodies, which will be used to recognize this viral or bacterial threat in the future. Okay, so let's look at the big picture. Notice how viruses and living cells may seem to have some things in common, but for the most part, they are very different. For instance, they both have nucleic acids, but viruses do not have cell parts such as cell membranes, cytoplasm, organelles. They only have nucleic acids and protein coats. Viruses also cannot reproduce asexually or sexually. They can only replicate with the help of their hosts. Notice how viruses cannot grow, obtain and use energy, or respond to the environment, which is why they are considered not living. Um, Alex, I think you mean mad cow disease, and it's actually not caused by a virus or a bacteria. Mad cow disease is caused by other non-living structures called prions, which are tiny bits of proteins that cause diseases by damaging the brain, such as those seen among mad cow disease. No, Alex, prions don't have DNA or RNA. Scientists actually believe that prions are misfolded forms of a protein that is normally found in brain cells. But when a prion enters the brain cell, it actually causes the normal form of that protein to be converted into the prion version leading to that disease. Yeah, I know, Alex, it is pretty scary, but that's why it's important for us to continue research in areas such as biomedicine so that we can be able to find ways to prevent or destroy structures like these from posing a threat to life. Okay, now that we've gone over bacteria and viruses, you should be familiar with the following assessment standards from reporting category 1 and 5. Well, this concludes our virtual biology camp lecture on bacteria and viruses. Hope you enjoyed it, and that's it. Have a great one. Virus. 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 Virus.